From FingerLakes1.com, this is Inside the FLX. I'm Josh Durso. Last week, I sat down with outgoing Seneca Falls Central School District Superintendent Bob McKevney alongside his successor, Jeremy Klingerman, to talk about the leadership transition happening in that district. By the end of that nearly hour-long conversation, we had gone well beyond transition of leadership and landed in a familiar place, at least for me and and the two who joined me in that room. Uh, I've had dozens of educators on the show, and all of those conversations funnel toward one broad question. What will public schools look like in 10 or 15 years? Technology has become intimately involved in all aspects of learning, and when it comes to standardized assessments, their role is actively changing. McKevney talked about tests and how he views public schools, particularly high schools, evolving to look more like colleges than stereotypical classrooms of the past. But everything is up for debate, and it seems that educators are leading the pack when it comes to this reinvention of what learning is all about, As McKevney explained, something as simple as a homework assignment can be very difficult to measure in terms of student success. I really think assessments or tests should drive your instructional plan. So no longer is is, it should be it begin with the end in mind. So the fact of the matter is the test just doesn't identify what you know or what you got right or wrong. To some degree, it helps the teacher with some planning as far as what needs to be retaught or what needs to be reinforced. I'm a big believer that the current day and age and moving forward, the more that kids can demonstrate their learning in class, the better, um, because you don't know what it's like outside. So let's use homework as an assessment, not just a test. But very often, teachers will give homework to see what they know. But you don't know the conditions they're doing the homework in, whether they're getting support, so, or what kind of technology support they're getting to do the homework. So the fact of the matter is performance-based assessments have entered into the picture. I don't know that traditional tests will go away, but I think they have to serve multiple purposes. Um, and any time that kids can demonstrate their learning through performance um, measures, I think that's helpful because those are that's the content and the skills they're going to maintain. The traditional tests, they prepare for the tests but what kind of long-term memory are they going to have based on that? So I think goal and purpose is different, and I think everyone needs to recognize that moving forward. Klingerman, the incoming superintendent in Seneca Falls, agreed, but how quickly those changes can be realized and what role the federal government would play in allowing for those changes are two important components of this discussion. Um, Assessments are are necessary. Um, How often, what format, uh, the purpose, what are you trying to you know, get from those uh, as, a, as a learner so I can grow? Um, obviously, you know, what, what, that, that's what drives it. What's the purpose or reason for it? But um, I'm not sure how far down the road that you may see some of the uh, what we consider traditional tests maybe go away versus do they just continue to evolve and, and look different. But those um, large assessments, uh, formative assessments are, are, are changing you know, over time but still there. And I think that's a it's a major shift. I talked about higher ed. It's a major shift all the way up to our federal government um, because when we talk about accountability measures, um, it's tough to measure that portfolio that a student turned in right at the end of a project uh, versus taking some uh, common assessment that everybody, it's very similar that everybody's taking, and now you can run the data and you can uh, run the reports from accountability measures um, because everything's tied to funding. So it really is going to take a whole different look at where we place education in our society. Um, And I think that that locally, very important. There's no question that um, people believe in the educational system here in Seneca Falls, right? But on a larger scale nationally, and you look at other countries, 
um, that value that we place overall on uh, the benefits, the need for educating our, our youth and hopefully developing them into being uh, lifelong learners. I think that mentality and, and where we place that value needs to It really to does seem that teachers and administrators are starting to look locally for solutions. They are looking for ways to integrate classrooms, break down traditional barriers, and provide students with new ways of learning to ensure that they are not just memorizing for tests, but actually learning something and taking something from the process. And that process is interesting. We'll get back to the government's role in all of this change in just a second. I think it is. Uh, you know, the, the thing that we fight in our traditional public school systems is that inertia of doing things the way that we've always done them before. So very much, it's still very much true that we have a system where, you know, you go to English class and you go to science class and you go to math class and, you know, we have to, we have to work hard internally to make sure that the connections are being made or to uh, very uh, deliberately schedule uh, the, that kind of cross-pollination, if you would, um, to make sure that, you know, the, the things that we're learning in one class are interacting with the things that we're learning in other classes. And so, you know, you, what you see nowadays... That's Stephen Zielinski. He's the superintendent at the South Seneca Central School District. South Seneca is one of the most rural districts in the Finger Lakes, one of the poorest, and has seen a stark enrollment decline over the last 30 years. But that doesn't mean they are any less focused on making sure the process of learning is effective for students across the board. The thing that I love the most about it is the idea that we're really uh, taking on the, the whole concept of integration, that one subject is not a silo all by itself, and that these things interact with each other the same way that our, the human brain does and the way our real lives do. So, you know, it's, in a lot of ways, it's been very artificial all these years to separate out the subjects. And so uh, movements like STEM are just a good recognition that you know, these things talk to each other. (laughs) So what does any of that have to do with standardized tests? or the public school system more broadly? Well, the state is taking notice that classrooms are working to teach to a broader message. Furthermore, through the state's acknowledgement, it's giving districts like those in the Finger Lakes more room to continue growing and changing what they're doing. Freed up to get yeah, I'm, exci- what they I'm excited about the conversations that are happening at the state level. Um, you know, when you interact with people from uh, the Department of Education and, and uh, um, those that are making the regulations, there is a strong recognition that things are changing um, and that they need to change, and it's a good thing that they're changing. Um, but, you know, we still have that system of Carnegie units in the high school and regents exams, although there is a, there's a move now. You know, it used to be a certain number of regents exams were required for graduation. Now they're, they're building in some flexibility for that. Mm-hmm. Um, there just did some regulations at the middle level to um, give local school districts an opportunity to build a program that's a little bit more tailored to their own community. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are great Uh, pieces of the puzzle, a good movement in the right direction. But, you know, as I said, the system is still the system. And, you know, it's hard for a classroom teacher not to be paying attention to that regents exam at the end of the year as the primary method by which um, everybody um, evaluates whether it was a successful class year or not. Here's where things get really complicated, though. Uh, State and federal expectations are not always aligned, and it's almost like teachers have two sets of guidelines to operate by. While New York State is recognizing change, the federal government, as Klingerman alluded to earlier, not so much. Uh, Zielinski says there are tons of options, though, and that creates equal parts excitement and trepidation. The, everything is complicated. Right. So, you know, there are, there are federal regulations as well as state regulations. So as much as New York State wants to move in a direction to decouple the testing from uh, teacher evaluation, there are still federal regulations that require it in some manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you talk about, uh, you know, has it been a successful year for the student, mostly what you want to say is, has growth happened? 
and how exactly do you measure growth? And that's where the devil becomes in the details because, uh, you know, the most traditional way to measure growth is with some sort of assessment. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, we've known about other kinds of assessment, authentic assessments, portfolio assessments for a very, very long time. Um, but putting together a system um, that uh, somehow, uh, you know, makes it clear how a teacher is going to be evaluated can be a pretty big challenge. So um, yes, excitement, but also a little bit of uh, trepidation because you got to figure it out somehow and you got to meet both those state and federal regulations when you do it. When we return from our break, technology and what it contributes to the question, what will public schools look like in 10 years? This episode is brought to you by Herman Brothers Furniture Store. Honesty, integrity, and reliability in service since 1945. Stop in today or visit hermanbrotherslions.com to learn more. And by Woody's Bar and Grill, a unique, relaxing dining experience in the heart of the Finger Lakes. Learn more and check out their menu by visiting woodysbarandgrill.com. And also DeSanto Propane. Switch to DeSanto and learn how savings can fall right into your lap. Visit DeSantoPropane.com to learn more. Welcome back to Inside the FLX. I'm Josh Durso. So far, we've been wading through the regulatory world of public schools, trying to answer a basic question. Uh, what will it look like for a middle and high school student in 10 or 15 years? Moreover, what will that learning process or experience look like in another 10 years? It's important because of the significant change that's happened in the last decade alone. We're talking about technology. Zelensky says that teachers and administrators have had to focus on bringing an evolution to students because they have been born into technology. Remember, up until recently, schools had students who lived before mobile computers like smartphones were a mainstream item. Now, nearly every student has an electronic device or has access to some device that is connected to the internet in some way, shape, or form, and it's part of their learning process. Kids um, that are graduating high school today have grown up in a world where they're so much more connected to the rest of the world um, than a few generations ago. And, you know, however you feel about social media, however you feel about, uh, you know, internet-based uh, tools, the, they're the reality. And it's what kids have grown up in. Even 10 or 15 years ago, I was reading that, uh, you know, WWW for a young kid doesn't mean World Wide Web. It means whatever, whenever, wherever. And uh, so when you grow up in that environment, um, it becomes a part of who you are. And, you know, I like to talk about education as helping kids uh, make sense of the world. Um, it's this sense-making idea of the way that the brain works, and the brain likes to do that. So, you know, you, you mix curiosity in with, uh, you know, your base knowledge, and it's a, it's a great recipe to learn something new. And part of the experience of our high school students nowadays is interacting with people beyond their community um, through these platforms. And I think that it uh, it's a fundamental difference about the way that they interact with the world. And I think that's, not only that's imp is that important, but uh, it's necessary for them to be successful later on. You know, the days of just uh, spending your entire existence in your own small community with the people that you know uh, are probably over. And, uh, you know, uh, young people embrace that. It's not in that's not intimidating to them. 
So if, as he says, technology is a reality, what does that reality look like? What does it mean? Well, it varies by district, of course, but it also varies by grade level. I think right now, if you were to think about a normal daily student, it depends on, on the level. So if I'm going into Frank Knight, you know, I could see anything between a Chromebox, a Chromebook, a iPad, right? Mm-hmm. So the technology is very vast. <clears throat> That's Jim Bruni. He's the administrator of business and operations for the Seneca Falls Central School District. He's played a big role in imagining and executing new ways that technology can be implemented or integrated into learning. And obviously the activities that they do within each one of them are totally different. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's what the student themselves can utilize individually with their hands. Obviously there's other technology pieces in the classroom with smart boards and other items. But as we start to get through uh, grades 3, 5 and up to the high school, we really focus a little bit more on the actual Chromebook and the laptops. Um, tries to build in a little more of the skills of <laughs> typing too. That was a lost art uh, once everybody made a switch to uh, iPads. Uh, so I think we made a, an effort to start at grade two and three and really build that up using using Chromebooks. Uh, but you know, it also allows them when they get to the middle school, high school, to be a little more independent on their work. Uh, whether they have the Chromebook themselves and they take it home. Um, it allows them to create work at school, work with students, collaborate with teachers, and then take it home and work and collaborate at home as well. Is typing still taught in, in schools or is that is it gone? Typing is taught in schools, surprisingly. It but okay. it, uh, it, it, I think it went a, a good stretch about a year or two when uh, students got into using all, all the iPads and the apps, which are phenomenal, but too much of the touching of the screen it really does cause some issues we've seen. That's Jim Bruni. He's the administrator of business and operations for the Seneca Falls Central School District. He's played a big role in imagining and executing new ways that technology can be implemented or integrated into learning. As technology is applied in different ways throughout the learning process, administrators have had to find new ways to measure progress. In Seneca Falls, that means a survey to graduating students, which will be repeated over the next several years to observe their progress and how prepared students were graduating from high school. It's important data that gives a district legs to stand on when reviewing educational opportunities in the classroom, especially when state or federal entities ask administrators to validate individual classroom practices. Well, part, I think, Josh, of what we need to do, and and we're starting to put things in place to make this happen, is to get feedback from students who have graduated from Minders Academy in terms of how ready and how prepared are they for the next step, whether that's work or if that's college. Um, are Are we putting technology in their hand and using it the right way or equipping them with the right devices and the right programming um, so that when they leave Seneca Falls and they or they leave Minders Academy, that they're prepared for that next level. Um, and in doing so, it's about asking them. You know, we're starting to put a, a survey into place at the end of this year with seniors <clears throat> saying, "How prepared do you think you are?" And then we'll survey them again 18 months out of high school to reevaluate that, and then five years out again to say, "Now that you're out in the real world, whatever that means for you, how prepared have you been?" Um, and what you know, what kind of a job did we do uh, in helping mm-hmm. you prepare for that? So getting feedback from them, I think, will help guide and help answer that question. I think that some of those answers we don't have yet because things are changing so much, right? Mm-hmm. So we just have to kind of keep our finger on the pulse to kind of know how we have to navigate and adjust based on what mm-hmm. what's changing with technology on a daily basis. Amy Hibbard, principal at Elizabeth Cady Stanton Elementary School in Seneca Falls, says implementation of technology comes down to creating the best outcomes for students. And as she walked us through the ways in which this is accomplished, the opportunity that technology provides students as they grow and learn became crystal clear. So the implementation really is all about how we can engage and empower students to not only access material differently, but also to um, show what they know, show what they've learned in in different ways. So for example, um, we might have stations going on. So a teacher is with a group of five students doing a little mini lesson. There might be another station of students on Chromebooks and they're creating Google Slides together. So they're sharing their material and doing a collaborative creation. Where another section, there might be five students on their Chromebooks and they're accessing some digital content. So they might be reviewing something that they've already learned or perhaps 
perhaps enrichment for a student who's already met the learning targets who can move on to the next section. Um, and then there's you know other areas that we are able to access software. Um, discovery <coughs> education is something that we use frequently. So students are doing things like watching a virtual field trip of a museum um, as part of their learning content on colonial trades. So they're they're at, they're. Uh, accessing the museum that might be, you know, on the other side of the country, but they're able to walk through virtually and, and answer those questions and have that learning take place. This is where the educational fork in the road also becomes clear, as Jody Verkey explains. She's the Director of Curriculum Instruction Assessment and Professional Development in Seneca Falls. Her take in short not all students are the same, not all students learn the same way, and not all students can be prescribed a single method for developing knowledge and skills to best fit in the post-high school graduation world. Progress. Students have begun to monitor yes. their own progress, right? So that's, that's where the, the ownership piece comes in for students. When they feel like their learning is relevant and that they have some um, impact, right, on, the, on what they earn instead of what grade they get from a teacher, right? It's kind of changing that mindset from the teacher gave me a B or gave me a 75 to I earned it. And then what kinds of things can I put into place to maybe improve that grade? What kinds of things do I need to practice? What are the skill sets that I need to work on? So it, it really opens the door to conversations between the student, the teacher, and even the parent and how we can support student growth with the student being the center instead of the student kind of being on the side and the adults talking about the student. We are trying to bring that the student into the game um, at, a, at, a, at a very early level so that they can learn to monitor and make adjustments to their own learning um, to really have that sense of ownership over what's happening. So uh, you've all talked a little bit about the, the balance of, of this whole thing. Um, what are some of the traditional elements that are still, obviously textbooks, they're not dead, they're not yep. gone, right? They're still there. Yep. Um, what are some of those things that, that maybe were included in, techno or in uh, education 10, 15, 20 years ago that still are, and just because technology has come along doesn't mean that they've been pushed to the side or that they're right. in the dust? I think Amy spoke to this a lot. It's about what are your learning objectives, right? What do you want students to be able to walk away knowing that they learned? And then it's the question, and this is where the teacher becomes so valuable, how am I going to get students Students there. It's about the delivery of it. And does technology play a, p a part in that at that time for that lesson? If so, great. If not, great. That's fine. Whatever it is. And it may it may come down to student choice in that factor, right? I may be a student who's really who's really great on um, really great with technology or really interested in researching. And you know, Mr. Bruni might be a kid who would rather, you know, open a textbook or take a multiple choice test. So it's really about knowing your students or allowing them to have choice in how they're either showing their learning or how the actual learning is happening. So it just, it, it's another option. It's not the be all end all to anything. Next week, we continue this story with the second part of this special two part episode. If education is going to look drastically different in the coming years, what will some of the programs that make up middle and high school learning look like? What do administrators and educators make of those programs? Those answers all coming up next week. Inside the FLX is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and the FingerLakes1.com app. You can see past episodes of the show by visiting www.insidethefx.com. Thanks to Bob McKevney, Jeremy Klingerman, Jody Verkey, Stephen Zielinski, and Amy Hibbard for making this story possible. I'm Josh Durso, and I will see you back here next week. <laughs>